Uh, we have a leadership component uh, for all our staff at the University of Maryland. So one of our academic advisors in the uh, leadership forum was given the assignment to get somebody to come talk to them about leadership. So she looked up and she said, well, I want to hear from Demora Smith. And she phoned him. He answered the phone. She asked him to come. And he said, certainly. When, when do you want me to come? What do you want me to say? Now, he was just going through the negotiations for his labor agreement with the players and with the NFL. And he took time out of his busy schedule to come sit down with this group of people. Didn't even know him, but he said yes, because it's important to me. But I know when I was coming up and I had uh, things that I wanted to do and hear from people I wanted to hear from that, you know, I had to repay my debt. So, DeMorris, come on up, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, DeMorris Smith, the executive director of the National Football Players Association. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, what I want to do today is just do two things. Uh, and I, I always boil it down to two things because, as my wife would say, I normally forget what the second thing is. So two things I want to do today. One, I just want to share a few remarks with you about the space between challenge uh, and opportunity and the way in which our organization thinks about that space between challenge and opportunity. Second thing I want to do is, because I spend, again, as my wife will gladly tell you, I spend most of my time talking in our household. I'm not sure my wife really listens, but I spend a lot of time talking. I want to turn it over to you guys for a, a period of, of question and answer. I've got to grab a plane at, at noon, so I have kind of a hard stop around 10, 10, 15, but I think it's important for us, for our organization, for the National Football League Players Association, to really have a dialogue. And so it is with really that thought that I wanna start talking about that space in between challenge and opportunity. So for the people in the audience uh, who work in sports, who work in senior positions of leadership, who answer to either a group, an institution, a board of directors, for you people who do not have any challenges, you can now leave the room. It's, it's, it's all good. Uh, for all of you who have all of that squared away, there's food, refreshment, there's a cupcake station, I'm sure, somewhere. Um, for all of you, everybody else like me who's, who has challenges and opportunities, this is, this is the place in which we live, right? We live in that spot where, frankly, people come to us or people rely on us because there are no easy answers about where th we need to go between challenge and opportunity. And for us and our, certainly our organization in 2009, when I took this job, we were certainly, as some would say, faced with some challenges. 2009, the owners of the National Football League, oh, and by the way, I always start off one of these conversations, I'm, I'm somewhat famous for parentheticals, I tend to be rather blunt. So if anybody in the room is offended by things that are rather blunt, once again, I'm sure in the institutions that you work in, no one's blunt. Um, but just for this afternoon, if you will just indulge me for a second. In 2009, when I took the job, uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to follow a man named Gene Upshaw, who had the job for 26 years, after he had an 18-year Hall of Fame career. Okay. That's a challenge, because walking into this job, of course, I've never really been a part of the sports world, as uh, everybody from ESPN to CNN, people on the street, grandmothers, small children, um, he doesn't really know what he's doing. He's never been a part of football. He never played football. He wasn't a particularly great athlete. He's not exactly that tall. All of those things were things that are certainly hurled at you all the time, but what is that? Yet another challenge and opportunity. But those things paled in comparison to the fact that the owners of the National Football League had decided to lock out all of our players as of 2009. They told everybody that it was going to happen in 2011. It wasn't a secret. So the challenges and opportunities are what? You have a group of players who play for primarily about three and a half years. They come from your institutions. They have a new leader after their leader literally went into the hospital on a Wednesday, died on a Sunday. 
and you have a group of men, a group of leaders, who are now tasked with how do we figure out how to maneuver our way through a new collective bargaining agreement negotiation where, frankly, the first thing that's going to happen is that the owners are going to lock you out, cut off your health insurance, take away the ability to earn a living. We had over 150 mothers who were expecting children who found themselves with no insurance. You have 20, 25 kids of players in the National Football League who were special needs kids, and the league cut off their insurance. So let's be blunt. A lockout is designed to do one thing. It's designed to choke you out so that you will be forced to take a deal that's not good. It is what it is. So walking into that challenge and that opportunity, there were a myriad of obvious issues that we had to deal with. The league wanted the players to give up 20% of their salary. They wanted to change the, the pension that people like Gene Upshaw, John Mackey, Reggie White, Freeman McNeil. They wanted the players to give up a pension that those players fought for, change it from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan. They wanted a strict rookie wage scale, which would again, I know everybody's fond of talking about wage scales, but think about this economically for a second. Because our players only play for three years, if you agree to a strict wage scale and every rookie signs a three to four year contract, you're basically locking that young man into a stair step salary for what? The entirety of his career. And then the last thing, of course, they wanted the players of the National Football League to, two, to play two more games. For those of you in football, for those of you as athletic directors, whether you're trainers, whether you know anything or work with anybody from the medical department, you know what a grueling schedule it is. 18 games would kill our guys. So it is into that sort of challenge and opportunity that all of us started asking all sorts of questions. How much of the $9 billion in revenue should be our share. What should we do about the growing rise of concussion awareness? What should we do about the fact that they want us to play two more games? What do you do about the fact that players are getting larger and the speed of the game is getting faster? What should we do about health care for our former players? How come so many of our former players are in trouble within a short time after they leave football. All of those questions are always playing out over and over and over again as we are getting ready for what is going to be a lockout. And it wasn't until then that we decided to pull back, and again, for the professors in the crowd, this one's for you. We actually decided to say and think about an ontological question. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? Where do we start? And we figured out as a group of leaders that that is where we needed to begin that ontological question. And why is it important? Again, just for the sake of, of uh, delving back into the good times where I used to teach. I used to tell sort of the first year philosophy classes about ontology and you could say anything. You could talk about Hegel, no. He's not going to go to Hegel today. Okay, everybody, rest assured, I know everybody's starting to run out of the room. Easy ontological question, right? A knife plunges into flesh and cuts it. And you think about that just in and of itself, and you ask yourself a number of questions. Is it good or is it bad? What's the answer? We don't know. If it's a knife cutting into flesh and you're a surgeon, trying to save a life, what is it? It's good. If it's a knife cutting into flesh at Morton's or Ruth's Chris, it's very good. If it's a knife cutting in, into flesh and it's a crime scene, it's bad. So when you take an ordinary act that sounds very, very simple, the significance of that act, the meaning of that act depends on what? where you start and where your perspective is. So let me see if I can frame this up real quick in the world of, of the National Football League.
2007, Philadelphia Eagles are playing the New Orleans Saints in a playoff game. Two still playing uh, veteran players, Reggie Bush, Sheldon Brown. Sheldon comes off the edge and does what? Blows him up. Blows him up. The hit decleats, as we like to say in the business of football, Reggie Bush. Ball flies one way, body flies another way. Sheldon Brown gets up and walks away. Reggie Bush stands up, gets back down, crawls away. What do we know about that, just again, from an ontological standpoint? What happened? Legal hit, completely legal. Form tackle. If you watched it in slow motion, when you see Reggie, I'm sorry, Sheldon Brown's arms open, the body flies away from him so quickly that he doesn't have time to wrap up. No head-to-head -head contact, shoulder into target of the body. That is who we are. That is where we start. Why? Because the way that we look at the world of football the way that we look at what we are, what we're supposed to do in the world of football is what? This is every day. So when we take a look at those issues, that hit, where we start, two things become apparent. As a head of the union, I represent both the hitter and the hittee. The person who hit the ground, tremendous athlete, who was theoretically what? Injured. Now, the reality of it was, just so we always tell the end of the game, everybody who remembers that game, what happened, Reggie Bush took one play off, came back, torched the Eagles <laughs> for the win. But the reality of it is, whether it's Sheldon Brown and the fact that will he have shoulder injuries in the future? Probably. Will Reggie Bush have injuries that we will need to deal with in the future? Probably. When you look at the issue of what's happening in that game, what's around it, is there money at stake? Absolutely. It plays out live and in public. Absolutely. There are people who want to win and there's people who want to win even more. Absolutely. You have 53 players on each side of that field. Does that hit? Does that game affect them? Absolutely. But what else? The thousands of people who weren't good enough to play in the National Football League. Are they impacted by what we do every day? Absolutely. Are there people who will play this game for five years, six years, seven years? Absolutely. Are there people who will never play? Absolutely. And what are we to do as an organization of young men, not, not me obviously, but young men, what are we supposed to do as a group to think about what we need to do? Because what do we have? The challenges that we have there or that that was a completely legal hit that includes everything from money to TV contracts to injuries to retirement to prevention to injury care. But what do we do with the opportunity of how do we get it right? So two quick things on how we decided as a group to get it right. First, intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty. Back in the day before uh, concussions became such to the forefront, ESPN used to have uh, a show called what? Jacked Up. We all remember Jacked Up. We all, are, some of you are not, but the older people, you guys in the front, um, the older people remember when you could buy, yeah, I'm pointing at both of you. Um, older people, you can remember where you could buy NFL's greatest hits, right? I bought them on Betamax. You may have bought them on VHS. Um, but the reality of it was we used to live in a world where we glorify the hits. Now, there are people who will say that we don't do that anymore, but intellectual honesty tells you what? Our fans enjoy this game because they want to see the best players in the world playing the best game at the world at what? The highest speed in the world against people who can hit the hardest in the world. That's reality. So the intellectual honesty that comes from that isn't, isn't just one where we can put the bag over our heads and say, hey, we don't glorify hits anymore, so we're fine. We may not have jacked up anymore, but when I took this job in 2009 
And when this hit happened in 2007, the head of the National Football League's concussion committee was a rheumatologist. I never get tired of saying that one. True. At that time, 2007, 2009, even into 2010, the same rheumatologist was trying to keep the studies that we now know from Dr. Amalu, Kevin Guskowitz, and others from the University of North Carolina, that same doctor was trying to suppress, suppress the results of those studies. That's intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty, last year we had 4,500 injuries in the National Football League. We only have 1,800 people who play. Three per man. Intellectual honesty, according to the National Football League, you will have something like 15,000 players who have suited up and put on an NFL uniform. Yet less than 700 of them have played more than three years. Intellectual honesty. It takes you three years to vest in the National Football League before you can get five years of health care. And that's good. Five years of post-career health care. But the reality is that five years of post-career health care does not cover any of the injuries that you suffer at work. How many people here have heard about workers' compensation? Okay, how many senior administrators, athletic directors, have heard about workers' compensation? Of course, it's the world in which you live. Workers' compensation in America is designed to do two things. One, if you get hurt at work and you miss wages, it compensates you for that under a state-run system. The second thing that workers' compensation does in America is if you have injuries at work, it will provide you health care for the injuries you suffer at work. In the National Football League, the owners of the National Football League have systematically been trying to exclude players from workers' compensation. Intellectual honesty. In North Carolina, the Carolina Panthers just introduced a bill recently where if any player makes more than $200,000 or so in a year, and that player gets hurt, that player can never file for lost wages in California. Now, even though that player's contract is not guaranteed, what the Carolina Panthers have done is to simply come out and say that if a man gets hurt at work and loses his wage, he is no longer able to get the same wage cover that every American would ordinarily get. And that, my friends, is intellectual dishonesty. So we as a group of players, the first place that we have to stay in order to find how we take advantages of both those challenges, turn them into opportunities, is the fact of intellectual honesty. So what did we do? In 2010, we created our own Mackie White Concussion Committee. Why? Because the league's committee at the time was called the Mild Traumatic Brain Committee. I don't know what a mild traumatic brain injury is. They don't exist. Either you have a traumatic injury or you do not. But we created our own because why? Because the more we looked at issues of prevention, the more we looked at issues of care, we came up with a few conclusions about what we needed to do, this isn't a good sign, what we needed to do with respect to um, uh, how to handle injuries in the National Football League. So for us, very quickly, you can tell that you know, this, is, uh, this is what I don't do. Anyway, um, let's look at it very quickly. Okay, physics, thankfully, not quantum physics, because after all, I did not do well in math. Mass and the speed of our players is increasing. That's just a fact. Just a fact. So the more we talked to our Mackey White Committee, the more we delved into two issues, the things that we know about concussions and the things that we don't know. There is a whole host of things that we do not know. But the reality of it is, there is a great number of things 
that we do know. Force, mass time speed. Everybody saw what happened with Reggie Bush, Sheldon Brown, when they talked to Sheldon Brown after that hit and asked him what that hit felt like, Sheldon Brown, quote, said, it felt like I was running through a cardboard box. Now, the reality of it is that has nothing to do with the 200-plus size of Reggie Bush. What it had to do was with the size of Sheldon Brown and the speed with which he was running when he met an object that was almost stationary. That just simply is force times speed. It's what we know. So the way that we look at injuries and especially concussions in the National Football League is the risk of injury is simply a determination of that force times frequency. Times frequency. So we don't know, for example, and again, uh, I'm not a neurologist and I don't play one on TV. I did not sleep at a certain hotel. But the reality of it is there is a tremendous amount of things that we do not know when it comes to both traumatic brain injuries and sub-concussive events. We don't know the exact relation to the amount of force, the amount of frequency when it comes to a whole host of things. The, the, the absolutely brilliant work that Kevin Guskowitz is doing at, at the University of North Carolina and along with Dr. Cantu and others um, I, I always say uh, Kevin because, again, I'm a University of Maryland guy, University of Virginia guy. We like to stay in the ACC until recently. Um, so you have, to, you, have to do, you have to take that one because it's easy. But when, when we take a look at all of the things that we don't know, we don't know why some 70G hits result in concussions and why some don't. We don't know why some people have the early onset of Alzheimer's and take hits, and some don't. We don't really understand why certain physio-neuro ailments result in players who've never had a concussion. And you'll take a look at players who have had concussions, and, and they don't have any ailments. We don't know. We don't really begin to know, at least right now, sort of the relationship between vitamins and other drugs and whether they can prevent um, or reverse the, the effects. But what we do know is this. We do know that the frequency with which there is head to head, head to body, head to knee, head to ground contact, the frequency of even those sub-concussive or sub-G force events matters. So we as a group of people, when we were looking at the issue of challenges and opportunities, our players made a simple decision. We cut out two-a-days for a reason, because we came to the conclusion that if we reduced frequency, we will reduce risk of injury. That's just simple, simple facts. And no, we don't know what number of hits are okay. We don't know if there is a threshold. We simply don't no, but we do know that in a situation where you are doing everything to decrease the amount of frequency, you will decrease the amount of risk. So our questions about how players are taught to tackle, is it important? Yes, critically important, but so is frequency. How well and how well do we enforce no head-to-head -head hits? Important, incredibly important. Frequency is more important. So as we looked at those issues, intellectual honesty began to really take hold for us as a group of men. We demanded a change in who the head of the concussion committee was going to be. We made a decision that we would have our own committee to advise us on the effects of pain-killing drugs on concussions and injury. But what is the last thing about intellectual honesty that we know? You can do your best to prevent, prevent, prevent. But as we saw in that instantaneous hit between Sheldon Brown and Reggie Bush, what? Those things are going to occur. Now in that case, both of those players got up and walked off. But the reality is, when it comes to issues like workers' compensation, what we call injury care, 
the National Football League, need, League needs to do a better job. Simply does. And that becomes the next thing that we learned about the chasm or the gap between opportunity and challenge. Intellectual honesty, not enough. It's not enough. Our history, whether you talk about issues of voting rights for women, civil rights movement, what we make decisions on how we care for people who are underprivileged in our country, the history of how our country has developed as a group of people who were, what, accepting of people from other places, has been what? On one side, you had challenges to that, where honest and right-thinking people can come up with just really, only a couple of really hard thoughts intellectually, but what did it take to effectuate change? Moral courage. Moral courage. In our case in the National Football League, just to bring it back to the sports context, John Mackey was our first president when the AFL and the NFL merged. He was a five-time All-Pro when he decided to become the president of the NFL Players Association. He filed a lawsuit challenging the lack of free agency at that time, and instantly John Mackey went from an All-Pro to lower on the depth chart, traded from the Baltimore Colts. You can go down the line throughout our history, whether you're talking about Freeman McNeil, Kevin Mawai, um, Don Curry, players who at times of conflict between us and the owners of the National Football League, the intellectually honest answer was, if you were a rep or if you represented your union in the National Football League, the way in which you were dealt with, they cut you. It just is what it is. So again, going into this eventual lockout with a group of young men heading into a battle that we knew was going to be public, it was going to be bruising, the reality of it was you had conversations, I had conversations with groups of people, and those men decided that they were going to serve, they were going to have the moral courage, even though they knew they increased the chances that they were going to be cut. So people ask the question all the time, who would cut a player if he can play in the National Football League just because he was representing his union? The owners. But at each and every turn, the great and really everlasting thing about my job was to watch a group of people decide that they were going to represent their players and their future players no matter what. So while we are dealing with issues either in California, Arizona, now recently in North Carolina, where teams are systematically trying to deny injury care for players who got hurt at work, the moral courage factor in that is simple. It will demand moral courage on our part in order to try to fight it, but even greater, it would be great to see moral courage on their part to recognize the fact that when men get injured, the eventuality of injuries in the National Football League are things that you have a moral obligation to take care of. And that is just a simple fact. So as I conclude, and I do want to turn it over for questions. For us and for our organizations, I do believe that it is important, even imperative for us on both an intellectual honesty side and a moral courage side that there is a better communication and, and my hope, a great dialogue between the players of the National Football League, your conferences, your schools, and your athletic directors. Why? Because your young men are the ones that we inherit. And while I do not envy the challenges and the opportunities that you have, I do believe that the things that we can do together are things that can make that world better, not only for players of the National Football League, but for the institutions and the young people who are going to be there in the future. So the challenges and the opportunities that I would love for us to work together on, the simple fact that we have to make sure that our young people are educated educated through our systems, whether they go into the National Football League, the NBA, or anywhere else. Why? It's an intellectually honest, intellectually honest place to be, and it's the morally right conclusion. 
when we talk to our players about all of the benefits that they have now under the new CBA, whether it's tuition reimbursement, first or second year reimbursement, those are things now that without, without going almost too far, virtually every player who does not have a degree can go back to school in the National Football League free of charge and get their degree. And it seems to me that one of the things that we should be committing ourselves to is if we do have players or anybody else moving into the professional ranks or people who don't, working together to come up with a world where in five years we have a 99%, 100% rate of young men who have their degree within five years of the time that they leave school. That is a legacy, a legacy that you and I and our organizations can stand up and not only point to ourselves, but really point to the rest of the world about what? Our public institutions, our private institutions, our education system in America should be the envy of the world. We can't be in a world, I think, we can't be in a world if we have groups and segments of groups who aren't benefiting from that educational opportunity. Second thing, injury care. In the same way that we are, will continue to battle with who we have to battle with on the issue of injury care, injury care for all of our athletes has to be a priority. Simply has to be. Why? Because if we fail at that, we will not only fail, again, intellectually, we will fail as a matter of a moral imperative. And last, um, while all of that sounds like gloom and doom, I do envy one thing. I envy the fact that all of you are in institutions in the world where you have instant access to the best, the brightest people in the world. Um, I'm not gonna talk, well, okay, never mind. Um, sometimes, let me see if I can phrase it this way. Sometimes in the National Football League, it is very hard for us to break out of paradigms. Um, I can't tell you how often during the course of negotiations when we talked about things like injury care or cutting two-a-day practices where, you, uh, where I heard everything that you've probably heard before. Well, we've never done it that way. Well, this is the way we've always done it. Well, Dee, don't you understand football? I don't care. Because when you look at the issues of intellectual honesty and moral courage, you have to get to a point where you don't care, right? You have to get to the point where you care about those two things. So the innovation that you have access to, the opportunities that you have access to in your universities are unparalleled. Because the last time that you are ever at a place where you can truly be radical in your thought crazy in the ideas that you come up with, where you can touch multiple disciplines and say, solve this problem. I dare you, the only place that you can do that on a consistent basis is in America's colleges and universities. So the innovation that we need to fix our problems, I promise you, is more likely to come from you than to come from us. Now we'll take our stands and we'll take our licks, and we'll make our decisions. But when it comes to the issues of innovation um, and thought and moral courage and intellectual honesty, I do believe that it's you who hold the keys to our future. Thank you very much. Um, do we have, uh, you want to do yeah, time for that's questions? Yeah, nice. you want to take some questions? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm sure everybody agrees to everything. Any questions? Uh, I will start off by saying, uh, I come from a long line of Baptist preachers, so uh, I tend, as you know, to be a little bit of a walker and a talker. Um, it makes meetings very complex, of course, but, um, you know, a couple of things that, and if anybody does have questions, um, you know, fire them away. I mean, look, the good news about football, Economically, revenue standpoint, we're incredibly healthy. In all likelihood, between the next two years, uh, there will be $10 billion of revenue uh, to share between the players and the owners. There's about a 50-50 split of those. So economically, is, is our, our model strong and healthy? Absolutely. Um, yes, sir? Can you go into a little bit more about the CBA and the tuition reimbursement thing that you had mentioned? Yeah. Uh, question was, can I go into a little bit of a, 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 a 
conversation about the CBA. Under the CBA, there are two methods, uh, soon to be three methods of tuition reimbursement. There is um, a, t a tuition reimbursement program for players who have vested, and that's players who have vested, who have played three years or more. There's also a provision that will take care of um, certain grants for educational offsets for people who are less than those um, three years. One of the things that you know, we're really proud about under the CBA is we created $100 million uh, for research over the next 10 years, and that certainly has gotten a lot of publicity. One of the things that, that hasn't gotten a lot of publicity is we also dedicated $20 million a year on issues of transition for our players. So that issue of making sure that our young men um, are prepared uh, is something that we wholeheartedly believe in. So at a, at a, in a nutshell, every team, um, when I come to visit them, they, and they look, and I'll be dead honest with you, I, we have, I have what I believe is somewhat of a tenuous, tough relationship with our players. Um, I'm not their dad, I'm not their agent, not their coach, not their GM. Um, and, and the way in which we talk about things in a locker room is pretty, pretty blunt. Um, I believe that our young men need to have college degrees. I just simply do. When you look at the charts between the likelihood of moving into middle class or upper middle class within five, ten years, um, that, that graph is like this if you have a college degree, it's like this if you don't. Um, we're working with ways of even those players who may not want to go get a college degree of providing um, uh, tuition reimbursement if they want to study for a trade. But at the end of the day, um, we can work with any player. Money is never, should never be an excuse. Um, one of the things that I would love to have a dialogue with, uh, with you is a lot of our players are very interested in coming back to where they went to school. And, and that is a comfort zone for them. It's something that they understand. Um, the more and more we have stayed in this space, the more that we have realized um, that, that facilitating an environment for our players to be comfortable going back is important. So one of the things that, that I would love to see from the conferences from the schools is, is that reach back program where you could look at opportunities for our players to, to come back to the university, not, you know, not necessarily for jobs, but to come back, earn your degree while you're doing something else in an environment that's comfortable for them. And I think the, the, the easier that we can come up with ways of facilitating that, the better. Yes, sir. Yeah. Growing up as a leader and thinking they know everything. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the question was, how do we go about, uh, uh, you know, leadership training? Um, you know, we have, a, we have a very democratic system <laughs> in the National Football League when it comes to the locker room. And uh, players choose their leaders. And, um, you know, obviously every player in the National Football League agrees with everything I say. Uh, yeah. Um, but but what, what we stress, what I stress, um, isn't so much the content of what they want to talk about when it comes to leadership, but really the character of leadership. Um, you know, the, the, the saying that, that I have in a locker room is I want you to be a, a, a great young man because they're all, they're all young to me. Um, but but you want to be a good man in your community, a good man in your locker room, a good husband, a good wife, um, um, a good brother, um, but also a good leader. Because, you know, we are blessed to have some people who have served in leadership roles who I will dare you are some of the best leaders that I've ever seen. And I've been lucky enough to now have three careers, I think. But you know, uh, for the folks in Ohio State, I I'll tell you right now, you did a great job with a guy named Mike Vrabel. You've got one of the best leaders that I've ever seen on the planet. A and to have a man like that in a negotiation room who can turn to the owners and say, well, I know you guys want us to play two more games. I know you want us to work longer and get paid less. But the reality of it is, me as a linebacker, I can't will my linebacker spot to my son in the same way that all of you owners can will your teams to your kids. The only thing I can do, the only thing I can pass down, the only thing that I can will is a better, safer game for the man who's going to stand in my locker room after I'm gone. I, if you've got a guy who can deliver a line like that and not only say it but mean it, Somewhere along the line, 
um, somebody developed a great leader. And, and to me, that is really what the challenge is, not so much for us to develop them, but once again, we inherit them. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, the, the question is, you know, actually, you shut the thing that, that I had one more slide I wouldn't show you. The question was, state of the league, will it exist? Hey, look, um, football's going to be fine. But once again, um, where we start shouldn't be that football's going to be okay. We should always start with where we are and how to make it better. So let's just take a quick look at history. 1905, Teddy Roosevelt was president, right? You had 19 deaths, 19 deaths in college football in 1905. And the same questions were being asked. Is this sport going to cease to exist? 1905, 2013, things are okay. But what did we do? They outlawed the flying wedge. They outlawed crisscross tackles. We've done things about head-to-head -head combat, whipsaws, uh, horse collars, face masks. I don't care what you, what you look at this game. Over the course of time, we've made changes to make the game safer and better. And, and I do believe that those are right steps when it comes to prevention. I think where we have not done a particularly good job is on the issue of injury care. Because no matter what you do, um, you will have those hits each and every day. The fact that we had 4,500 injuries, uh, to me, isn't as scary an issue as we look, as, as when we compare it to how many of those players who get injured and who have lingering issues after football or manifesting injuries later on in football, how well are we doing taking care of those players who suffered injuries while they're at work? And, and to me, the greatest challenge that we have to the ethos um, of our game is that. Because it seems to me that if we get to a point 10, 15, 20 years from now, and we think we've done a great job on prevention, but yet we are seeing a, a group of, of people who are just simply uncared for about their injuries, um, it will be a shame on all of us. And, and to me, um, public shame has, has far more of a potential impact on, on a business model than anything else. Okay, one more and then uh, I'm racing to the airport. Yes, sir. Yep, the question was, what are we doing to, to address the financial uh, education piece? It is probably one of the toughest issues that we deal with in the National Football League. And again, um, an issue that, that we deal with toughly with our, our players. Um, we've had programs after programs after programs for 20 years uh, about financial awareness um, um, and making sure that, that players are, are knowledgeable about what they do. And, and I've come to and we've come to really one conclusion that we, that we reached a couple of years ago. Many of them don't work. Um, um, many of them don't work for a variety of reasons. Um, so where do we need to start from an intellectually honest standpoint? One, um, we need to start with our young people taking ownership and responsibility for who they are. I mean, that just simply is where it has to start. Why? Because if you individually don't think that you have a problem, you're the person who does not need a program. Um, so what we have started to do is, is two things. One, to start to identify each and every one of our young men before they transition into the National Football League. So whether it's some of you are familiar with Pathways to the Pros, Pipeline to the Pros, making sure that we can start to identify people who are going to be in that transition spot. And really the message is personal responsibility. I mean, if you come from a family any family and walk into the National Football League and you are a young man in the first year, you're not going to earn less than $300,000 or $430,000 a year. So the issue to me is this is an opportunity for you not to necessarily be thankful or happy about how much you're making, but to be thankful and happy for what this can do as far as springboarding you for the rest 
of your lives. So when it comes to the issue of, of whether it's financial um, sanity, that's inextricably tied to making sure that you've got your degree. What's your plan for when football ends? And I do appreciate that our guys tend to play in the National Football League because they can put themselves in this world that it's never going to end. It's going to end. So until you as a young man take it upon yourself to have the personal responsibility to take care of you and your family after football's over, that's where it has to start. Now when it comes to the programs, that's when you can avail yourself of them. Um, but I do think that that is something that we as a, as a group of, of people inside of this business have an obligation to work with each other. I mean, one of the things that I would love to see is for every player who thinks that they want to be draft eligible, I would love to be in a world where if a player thinks that he wants to be drafted into the National Football League, he has to have completed X hour of financial responsibility as a junior and X hour of that um, in, in his, um, in his uh, fall semester, <laughs> fall semester of his last year, right? Because again, those are the players that we're inheriting. And, and you know, the longer conversation that I think we have to have, just to be blunt, intellectual honesty, when does the combine take place? Combine takes place when? In, in the middle of what should be the spring semester of their senior year. So I'll leave on sort of a kaboom moment. I hate the fact that the combine occurs during the middle of the second semester of a guy's senior year when he should be in school. I hate that because why? Each and every one of you know that the player who thinks that he can play in the National Football League, the last time that he sets foot on our campus is when? The last day of the last game of that season. And then he goes off somewhere to train. So the intellectual honesty thing that we have to deal with is the fact that players are gonna wanna do that as long as the combine is when it is. So we either have to address that and try to figure out an educational fix to that or you have to figure out an intellectually onyx fixed to the problem of when that combine occurs. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Morris, thank you very much. Um, I did have a watch for you, but when you made the conference realignment comment, I'm not giving it to you now. <laughs> No, thank you very much well, look, on behalf and, of NACTA. We really appreciate well, thank it. Thank you very much. And let me say one thing. You know, the, the, Kevin, thanks for, for inviting me here. And, and I've had a great opportunity to speak at, at Maryland. And uh, Maryland's obviously someplace that's going to be close to me. But um, when you talk about um, moral courage and intellectual honesty, um, you're my idol. Well, because this, look, good. tough questions, tough answers, and we need tough administrators. Thank very you. Very kind of. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you very much. Hold on.